In a crime that shocked the world, a little two-year-old boy was abducted and murdered in 1993. For real crime now, James Bulger, a mother's story, which some viewers may find distressing. This is Denise. Her son, James Bulger, should be celebrating his 18th birthday this year. For the first time in 15 years, Denise wants to talk about life after her son's murder and her plans to build a school for bullied children as a lasting memorial to him. I think James has wanted me to do this. You know, his life was taken before he even started school. So, you know, just having his name over a school. It's going to be really nice to see. Frozen in time, the moment in 1993 that James was abducted. The crime was unprecedented and all the more horrific because his killers were children themselves. On Friday, February the 12th, 1993, Denise took James on a shopping trip to the Strand Centre in Bootle, Merseyside. At 3.30pm, they went into a butcher's shop. While Denise was paying, James wandered outside. It was only a few seconds before Denise noticed, but it was too late. James was gone. When security staff couldn't find him, they contacted the police. Mandy Waller, a young WPC, was sent to the shopping centre. The call would change her life. I was the first on the scene and the first to speak to Denise about James going missing. It was quite hard to get any details off her because she was so upset about him and, and sort of saying that, you know, he wouldn't have wandered off, he wouldn't have done this. He'd already been missing more or less half an hour and we conducted a search of the Strand ourselves as well. It wasn't long before local journalists became aware of the disappearance. Just on my routine police calls, I heard that a little boy had gone missing from the Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle, uh, and I heard that probably about five o'clock, maybe slightly after. And it was a bit of a toss-up, really, whether it would even make a story at that point, because it was the sort of thing you normally expect it to be resolved quite happily within an hour or two. I think initially, like any parent, you thought, well, He's probably gone somewhere inside the store. He may have gone inside a, a cupboard or under a counter or got somewhere where he couldn't, um, you know, get out of. That was the initial thought. But those early hopes faded. At 5.30pm, the Strand closed and James was still missing. Police then launched a major search operation across Bootle. We had patrol cars on the street with loudspeakers, members of the family had come down and really widening the search. But by the time it came to you know, bedtime on the Friday night and there was no sign of him, that's when then the really serious concerns started to come in. At the shopping centre, police and security guards began searching through the day's CCTV recordings. There are 16 cameras placed throughout the precinct and it's on a time-lapse system. So you get so many seconds on one camera, so many seconds on another. So the police officers then, we had a point of starting, which was outside the butcher's shop. We knew the time. So they had to sit there and go through the tapes over that period of time. In the middle of the night, officers identified the first frame of James, leaving the butchers at 3.39 p.m. They would soon discover a frame-by-frame -frame account of the crucial minutes following his disappearance. At 3.40 p.m., Denise was pictured on the ground floor, leaving the shop in panic. While she searched downstairs, James was seen on the top floor of the precinct one minute later, he appeared to be following two boys. The next frame police found 
would become the most haunting image of the case. Those grainy images where uh, you had the two boys walking out of the precinct, one boy holding James's hand. This was at 3.42 p.m. One minute later, James was with the two boys walking out of the precinct and towards the Leeds Liverpool Canal. It was just four minutes since he'd strayed from his mother's side. We were just looking for a missing boy when in actual fact it was an abduction. By now, James had been missing for more than 19 hours. Police organised a news conference. Just by me, so the butch just turns away from for a minute and then I look down and he's gone. If you've got me, baby, just bring them back. By this time, it was pretty clear that something very serious was wrong because uh, the police had declared it a major incident in which they're trying to enlist the public's help. Then when they showed the video footage, that's when you really begin to think that this is something very much out of the ordinary. I don't think anyone quite imagined the significance that those images was going to take on as events transpired. Good afternoon. Police searching for a missing two-year-old boy on Merseyside believe he may have been abducted. He was filmed by security cameras leaving the centre with two teenage boys. Close-ups of the youths don't reveal their identity, but police believe they're both white and in their early teens. We thought we were looking for boys about 13 years of age because it was very, very difficult to judge their height by anything in the precinct on the early pictures. And we all felt that they were probably in that age bracket. The police appealed for the boys to come forward and the search for James continued. Police activity today has centred on the nearby Leeds-Liverpool Canal. Witnesses said they'd seen a boy like James on the towpath with a group of other youngsters. We had specialist search teams out who were doing the canal, for example, who were doing the railway lines, all the wasteland. Um, it was a massive operation on searching. Now well over 30 hours since James went missing from this shopping centre. The already serious concerns for his safety have been further heightened as he faces his second night away from his parents. I was assigned to stay with Denise. And there's only so many times you can say, you know, it's going to be all right, or it's, you know, everything's going to be fine. And because by that time you're thinking, well, you know, it's not. If you've got me, baby, just bring them back. I don't think it takes much stretch of the imagination to understand how distressed she was. Denise had a daughter a short while before that was stillborn. And so she was probably more protective um, over James than most parents are over their children. Throughout Saturday night and into Sunday, more than a hundred officers were looking for James and every member of his family joined in the search. They had gone through incredible efforts. If, you know, if sheer will and sheer love for their son could have brought him back, then they'd have had him back safe, but fortunately that wasn't going to happen. On Valentine's Day 1993, the body of a toddler was found on a railway track in Liverpool's Walton district. About lunchtime, police officers from Walton Lane Police Station rang up and said, there's some young boys come running in here uh, and it looks as if the body's on the railway line at the back of the police station. The railway line was nearly three miles away from the Strand, the Bootle shopping centre where two-year-old James Bulger had become separated from his mother Denise two days earlier. CCTV had shown two boys leading him outside. Although the body hadn't been formally identified, Denise was told to expect the worst. She just went spark out for a while. You know, he told her, she screamed, and then it was like, Shh. and she was just not, not unconscious, but sort of like completely like out of it. Detective Sergeant Phil Roberts was on duty at Bootle Police Station that day. I heard this almighty screech, which came to, from at the bottom of the gut, and you just, even tears came to my eyes. James's body was identified by one of his uncles. He'd been found only 100 yards away from Walton Lane Police Station. 
At first, it seemed he'd been hit by a train. Myself and a couple of others immediately went up there and we actually saw what had actually happened to James. The nature of James's injuries immediately ruled out the possibility of an accident. We know it is a murder inquiry, not as we'd first hoped we were going to find James and return him to his parents. It is horrific what has taken place, and there must somewhere be somebody who will know the identity of the two boys who were seen with James. At that point, obviously, there's that awful realisation that everyone's worst fears had, had come to fruition. And coupled with that, the, was the puzzlement of, well, what were those two boys to do with it? How were they involved in it? In the days after James was found, Denise stayed with her mother, Eileen. At first, we couldn't even go in the same room. Uh, she didn't know what to say to me and I didn't know what to say to her. So it was like two mothers in the same, going through the same pain. It wasn't just me going through it, she was going through it as well. I think I just took each day as a call and took anything that was thrown at me. Basically, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what kinds of future I was going to have, if there was going to be one, and I just didn't know. I was basically in, a, in the dark. At Bootle Police Station, the investigating team was in shock. It was a horrendous murder. I know what happened. And sometimes it's best not to know what exactly happened. After James's body had been found, because I could see the effect it was having on the staff, I made my mind up that I wasn't going to tell them all the details of what happened to James. The coroner, Roy Barter, said it was the most dreadful and shocking case he'd dealt with in 25 years. In Liverpool, a horrified community began to grieve. A gesture of the city's outrage, which started as a handful of flowers, has now become a symbolic memorial. Among the many messages, one which sums up the question on most minds here, why? But Denise was unaware of the attention surrounding her son's death. She sort of divorced herself from the whole thing for a while. She was always sort of talking about James and saying, you know, what it was like at our sort of what sort of character he was and everything. He was just really cheeky. I mean, he has a very good sense of humour, a lot of character, always laughing. He was the most lovable, happy-going kid. <laughs> he used to try and dance like Michael Jackson, which was very funny, watching him. A lot of people ask me what that is around his mouth. A lot of people think it's milk, it's not, it's yoghurt. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. We were actually on holiday in um, Wales. We went away for a week with him. And he just said to yoghurt, yoghurt when that picture was taken. I keep a lot of pictures private. I don't like anyone seeing them. Um, I actually keep them in the loft with all his clothes and everything, because obviously I don't like looking at them all the time. But what, a, you know, what I've got in mind, to, you know, that'll always stay with me. No, that's something that no one can take away from me is the memories that I've got of him. To a lot of people, he's just a picture. Well, not to me, he's not. Every parent in the country can only feel the deepest shock at the abduction from a shopping centre and subsequent killing of James Bulger. Mothers of young children have become extra vigilant as a growing demand for these children's harnesses. Everybody was afraid, all parents were afraid that their child was going to be abducted. For goodness sake, keep tight hold of your children. Poor James only went missing from his mother for a matter of seconds and he'd gone and disappeared. The only lead the police had was the grainy CCTV footage of James's abduction. As I've stressed, we've got an open mind on these two boys. All we know for certain is they were with James. Detectives are desperate to speak to the two youths who were seen by the video cameras. They say it may have been a prank that went tragically wrong. None of us could have believed initially that any young person could have done to James what had happened. The amount of information that came in was unbelievable. 
you know, any other murder case, you'd have one person just to look at information. But we were having six or seven. More than 20 boys aged between 10 and 18 were questioned. Some identified by witnesses, others who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was walking past Mouse Lane Police Station and then they pulled me in because they thought that it was me on the photo. Then on Tuesday evening, two days after James's body was found, an apparent breakthrough. I got a call probably just after nine in the evening to say that um, uh, a boy had been arrested in Kirkdale. I basically filed a very brief news alert to the press association and very quickly got myself ready. And by the time I was leaving the house to go to the scene, uh, the news was breaking. Police hunting the killer of two-year-old James Bulger said tonight they've made an arrest in connection with his abduction and his murder. Lots of neighbours had seen the police activity, made assumptions and decided that this was the killer or one of the killers of James Bulger and things deteriorated to the point of a near riot. It was a very scary scene really and it demonstrated the level of you know, emotion that was, that was running in Liverpool at the time. Even though the boy was soon ruled out of the inquiry, he and his family had to move house. There's tremendous aggression with the public. People were so upset over what had happened that somebody could do that to a child. The requests for information continued, and on Thursday evening, the BBC's Crime Watch also launched an appeal. It was the first time the programme had featured a crime in the same week that it was committed. Good evening. Tonight we start with new details that have just become available on the case that's been uppermost in all our minds this week. The murder of two-year-old James Bulger on Merseyside. The programme showed new images of the boys enhanced by experts at the Ministry of Defence. These stills may look a little bit fuzzy, but they're a huge improvement on the originals. But as these images were broadcast, police were already holding two suspects back in Liverpool. They'd been arrested after a tip-off the previous evening. A lady who'd been away saw the news, saw the images we put out, and she said, I think I know who that is. She said, they're always away from school, they're always into mischief. And we then thought, well, we've got to go and get them. The next morning, two teams were ready to make the arrests in plain clothes and unmarked cars. Robert Thompson lived in Walton, not far from the murder scene, with his mother and two younger brothers. His four older brothers had all been taken into care. He was 10 years old. I went for Thompson, knocked on the door. The mother came down. I explained who I was and the reason I, what I was there for. I didn't see um, Thompson at that time. He was still upstairs. I spoke to his young brother, who was about seven years of age, and he said that uh, he knew about the murder, so much so that himself and Thompson had gone down to the scene of where the murder had happened with a bunch of flowers. At that time, you thought to yourself, no, he can't be one of the boys that's responsible. The other boy was John Venables. His parents divorced when he was three and shared custody of him, his brother and sister. Teachers described him as an attention seeker. He was also 10 years old. The door was answered by Mrs Venables and she called to John and he came to the top of the stairs. Uh, I was quite shocked to see uh, the age and the size of him. Both suspects were taken to separate police stations away from the media. Detective Superintendent Kirby travelled to London for the Crime Watch appeal, thinking that the boys they had in custody were too young to be responsible for murder. If anyone's got any other information whatsoever that they may think could be of assistance, again, please come to us. The arresting officers started the interviews late on Thursday afternoon. It was the first time any of them had interviewed murder suspects who were so young. There was no other precedent for it, so we literally had to, you know, set our own precedent uh, and deal with them in that way. This is an important interview. You're going to the Crown Court with it, whatever happens. If you make a mistake here, something could go terribly wrong. I couldn't be aggressive with him. 
everything had to be sort of sort of nice and easy softly softly you have to shut off your own feelings the police interviews were recorded but a court injunction now prevents them from being broadcast to protect their identities the first part of the interviews was you had to go through a process to make sure that they knew the implications of telling lies and telling the truth. The officers asked questions to establish whether each boy could tell fact from fiction. I said, what if I told you that Everton won 9-0 on Saturday? And he said, no, no, they didn't. That was a lie. So you have to also prove the fact that they knew what was right and what's wrong. To establish whether Thompson could tell right from wrong, Detective Sergeant Roberts asked him another question. Was it right or wrong that baby James should have been killed? It was wrong, Thompson replied. Once I proved that, I could sort of kick off the interview. In the first interview with Venables, officers asked him where he'd been on the day James was abducted. Initially, he admitted that he had been in the Bootle New Strand on that day. And in the end, he actually admitted to seeing James. In Thompson's second interview, he also admitted being in the Strand. He finally said he saw James Bilzer. But where he did slip up was the fact that he described the clothes he was wearing in detail. And for a young child of 10 years of age to remember that much of what a child was wearing. He must have been in his company for a long, long time. In my view, the key breakthrough was when John Venables asked if he could get fingerprints off skin. He, uh, on his arrival at the police station, he'd given his fingerprints. It was obviously playing on his mind as the questions were, were progressing through the interviews. When a child asks you that, there's something to it, and you're only asking for one reason. Thompson eventually confessed that he and Venables had taken James from the shopping centre. When it came to talking about James, it shuffled his legs, he started crying, but no tears. He knew what was right from wrong, because every time he got anxious, his feet would start going. So he knew he was lying. It's a great giveaway. By Friday lunchtime, Thompson had admitted taking James to the railway line, where he said Venables had thrown paint at him. Officers asked Thompson what James had said to them. He mimicked what James said, saying that he wanted his mum. And he actually says, I want my mum, and actually gave a sort of a, a voice like a three-year-old boy. Now, that was eerie. At 12.56 p.m., officers ended another interview with John Venables. Alone with his parents, he then broke down and confessed to being involved in the murder. Police were listening in. He actually admitted being at the scene of where James had died, uh, but all the time he was not the person responsible. He was always laying the blame with Robert Thompson. In the interview, he told us what had happened on the railway line and how James had met his death and what they'd done to try and make it look as though it had been an accident. To actually sit there and listen to what such a young child could get himself involved in, to that degree, is just frightening. Something that's stick in your mind forever. Robert Thompson still refused to admit to his own involvement in James's death. He blamed everything on Venables. I just knew he was the main instigator of the whole thing. There was no remorse, absolutely no remorse, definitely not. I won't be ever convinced that he had any remorse. Despite their differing stories, the police were now confident they had sufficient evidence against both suspects. 6.40 p.m. today, Saturday the 20th of February, 1993, two 10-year-old boys from the Walton area have been charged with the abduction and murder of James Bulger.
17 days after James's abduction and murder, his funeral took place. We wish that we could turn the clock back two and a half weeks. We wish so much that we could bring James back to you both and to all of us. It was a terrible day, it really was. I think it was the, the coldest day that winter and it was so bleak, which actually kind of felt right because it just fitted the mood of the, of the moment, you know, nationally and locally and, and in that church. You didn't realise what an impact it had got until you were sort of driving along and the whole streets were lined with people for much of the route, like, and you think, crikey, you know, this has had such a big impact. The 500 mourners outside the church that day are among the many people who have continued to support the family over the years. Denise and her second husband, Stuart, have kept all the letters and cards she's received from around the world. This is heavy. Just going through to the bottom of this box, there's just absolutely tons in one box here. This is just one of seven boxes and we've got how many sacks up there? There's another ten boxes in the lot. Oh, ten boxes. There's another five sacks. Five sacks. Total sacks. 18th of November, 1993. South Africa. We still get letters to this day from people that I don't know saying that they remember James, which I think is really lovely. But some of them wasn't even, you know, uh, James Bulger's mum, and that was it on the envelope. Or the parents of James Bulger, and they were getting here. Uh, Sarah Ferguson, she wrote to me, and I even remember what she put in her letter. She was saying uh, she was putting her girls to bed one night and she uh, thought of James and you know, thought, no, I should have been putting my child to bed when she was putting her two girls to bed. Um, she said she just had to write to me. She said she was crying and she just had to write to me and send support and sympathy to me. And I think it was lovely for us as well. And, you know, no one could get over just how many people were writing to me and how many people thought of James. And there was people saying that they were crying when it happened and... You, you can't imagine that, can you? And just by looking at that little box there, this, this bitch carries so many lessons. There's more good people in the world than what there is bad. And I've always said that. On the 22nd of February, 1993, the two ten-year-olds appeared before brutal magistrates charged with James's abduction and murder. A crowd of 300 gathered outside, and as the police vans left the court, a riot broke out. Liverpool is a place that has a really strong sense of community, and I think then when the realisation happened that those who'd committed this crime were actually from within that community as well, people felt a sort of futile rage at that, I think. The police had sent the vans out empty as a decoy, and it was quite a shameful scene, in all honesty. And you sort of think, well, what would they have done if the boys had been in that van and they had managed to get to them? The trial was set to start eight months later. The waiting was agony for Denise. I just wanted to get in the corner and stay there, lock myself away from everything and everyone. But, you know, I couldn't have done that. If anyone was going to fight for James, it had to be me, didn't it? I still find it hard to talk about. Um, at the end of the day, I shouldn't be sitting here talking about him like this. I should be talking to him. The trial took place in Preston, 40 miles away from the tensions in Liverpool. By this time, Denise and her then-husband, Ralph, had announced they were expecting another baby. Denise chose not to attend court. She just couldn't face seeing them every time. She just didn't want to sit in the same courtroom as them, as the two boys. And I think there's still parts of the case that she wasn't aware of, so she didn't want to hear them in court. And she didn't want to be under the public scrutiny while having been told those details. The first time I saw the boys, I don't really know what I'd been expecting or what I thought I was going to see. But I think the thing that struck me more than anything else was... They're just two ordinary little ten-year-old kids. They didn't look 
in any way deranged or capable of terrible violence. They were just they were kids. As well as pleading not guilty to James's abduction and murder, they denied a third charge, the attempted abduction of another boy in the same shopping center earlier that day. I think what people generally aren't aware of is the fact that at 12.30, a lady who had two children, a boy and girl, she saw Thompson Venables and overheard Thompson say, we'll take one of these. Now, she thought that they were going to go shoplifting. But well, Venables confirmed in his interview it was their intention to take one of those children into the road outside where the buses and the taxis are and push the child underneath the bus or the taxi to make it look like a tragic fatal accident. Thompson and Venables, who were now 11, were old enough to be convicted of murder, but only if the jury believed they knew what they had done was seriously wrong. Their police interviews were played in court where they were referred to as Child A and Child B. In the interviews, A describes an attack on James Bulger, admits being present, but blames B for it and says, I never touched the baby. They were trying to be crafty and trying to get out of it and try and talk the way out of it in the way that a child would try to talk the way out of any kind of trouble, really. Hearing that kind of behaviour associated with something as grave as this was, was a very strange experience, it really was. 37 witnesses were called. Each had seen James with Thompson and Venables at different points of their journey to the railway line. We were able to say to the court, we're not relying on what these boys are saying completely, because at each stage of that journey, there are other people who will corroborate and identify them and what they're saying they did or where they went to. They'd been seen at the canal, a busy roundabout, at Hillside School, on Breeze Hill. Some of the witnesses talked to them, asking if James was OK. As they walked across this field, they told a woman that the toddler was lost and they were taking him to a police station. Thompson told a school friend they met by City Road that James was Venables' brother and he was crying because he had fallen over. The last witness was a young girl who saw them take James up an embankment off Walton Lane. By that time, James had walked nearly three miles. It was like little snapshots within a picture of events that took place over, I don't know, probably an hour, hour and a quarter. The witnesses seemed to blame themselves to a large extent for not having intervened, which is a very understandable reaction. Um, but, you know, how were they to know? You just would never in your wildest dreams imagine that, you know, those boys could be capable of such a thing. The jury also heard forensic evidence. The blue paint that was found on James was also on the boy's clothing. James's hair was recovered from Thompson's shoe and Venables' coat. Within their shoes, uh, there was blood and hair, which actually confirmed what had actually taken place uh, at the scene, you know, to show that uh, um, the blood that was there was James's blood. That evidence proved that both Thompson and Venables had been involved in the violence. After three weeks, the jury were sent out to consider their verdict. People tend to think, you know, that it was just an instantaneous event that happened. It wasn't. Thompson and Venables knew they were going to kill a boy, a young boy, that day. They had ample opportunity to release him and let him go into the care of responsible adults, but they didn't. They led him all over the place to the railway line where they murdered him. But if the jury felt that Thompson and Venables were not responsible for their actions, they could only return a verdict of manslaughter. I was petrified, absolutely petrified. I remember sitting there thinking, this is stupid. I've waited for juries to come back more times than I care to remember. The jury returned within six hours. Denise came to court to hear the verdict. Guilty of murdering James Bulger, evil and brutal, says the judge. Two 11-year-old boys are tonight beginning sentences for the murder of James Bulger, the two-year-old Liverpool boy.
It was just total and utter relief, and I felt, yes, we've done it. And I just couldn't help but just getting up and going up to Denise, you know, and giving her a hug. The judge told Thompson and Venables that what they'd done was an act of unparalleled evil and barbarity. It was both cunning and wicked, and they would be detained for very many years. Less than a month later, Denise gave birth to Michael James. Well, I know why I'm here, because I had Michael. I think Michael did give me that strength that I needed to carry on. At the end of the day, I had this little boy in my arms that needs as a mother. He needs me, and he needs my attention. While the Bulger family quietly came to terms with their loss, James's murder continued to make headlines. People wanted to understand why Thompson and Venables had done what they did. There must be a reason as to why they took James that day. We as the interview team never really got to the bottom of, of what was behind it. We established the truth, we established the facts, but what was in the minds of John Venables and Robert Thompson, we never really found out. It was like probably what most people call a perfect marriage. Slightly different personalities, but brought together lethal. Uh, and that's what they had that day. I think the case left me with a, a different view of children and childhood and what children are capable of, and made me realise that there is the possibility for great darkness in young children that you just perhaps don't really like to think is there. I do have lapses where I look back and I think to myself, you know, how could it happen? Why did it happen? It should not have happened. More heartbreak followed for Denise when the judge announced the sentence. Thompson and Venables were to serve a minimum of eight years in local authority care. That was another massive blow to me. To get justice for James, I think they should have saved at least 15 years in adult prison. It was so horrendous, the crime. You know, he was only a baby at the time. Everything that he should have been looking forward to in life was taken away from him. So I thought, you know, if I'm going to fight this, I'm going to fight it on my own. And she did. The minimum sentence was raised to 15 years by the Home Secretary, but Thompson and Venables appealed, both in Britain and in the European court. Denise spent years campaigning against their release. You know, they took mine. What's going to stop them from taking someone else's? I don't think they should get an early release. Basically, I think 15 years is too early. I'm pleased that the UK government are continuing to fight the appeal. I know that the court reject the appeal and they give their judgment in due course. I dropped everything in the hope that I'd get some peace of mind and some justice somewhere down the line. But I never did. In June 2001, little more than eight years after murdering James, both Thompson and Venables were released on life licence. They are now 26 years old with new names. Nothing can be published that might reveal their identities or whereabouts. I felt like I'd just been told that my son was taken all over again. Because I thought, you know, it's something else that I'm not winning. Is there anything I'm going to win in this case? And unfortunately, none. Never won a single thing. At the end of it, I got nothing. That's why I've decided to turn a new chapter and, you know, give James a, a nice memorial. It's cool to find out. You can come here whenever you want. In February 1993, James Bulger was abducted and murdered by two ten year olds. His death put an unbearable strain on his parents' marriage and the couple separated in 1994. Three years later, Denise met Stuart Fergus. When I first met Denise, obviously, I didn't know who she was. And as we started getting more involved, she says, you know, James is a part of my life, always will be. If you think it's going to be too much, you know, be friends, but that's all it will be, you know. But I like Denise and... I'm still here. I've got my own words in as well. You're not meant to be changing anything, you're meant to just be copying it. You can't do anything about changing it, you know. He's got to change everything. And he starts to build a rabbit hutch and it turns into his shirt. He's been a shoulder to cry on. Yeah. Someone to show her, take everything else on. So really, I feel sorry for him. Yeah, he did have a head of hair until he met me. <laughs> 
Denise and Stuart married in 1998. As well as Michael, they have two sons of their own. She's so protective of the boys. She's very aware that she doesn't want their photos being put out anywhere um, because she still fears that the two, that Thompson and Venables, are still there, like, you know. No one could understand how I feel. Right down to the kids playing in the front garden, don't like them by the railings. I sit in that chair right by the window so I can watch them. It's a horrible thing that I've got to live with now if I go out shopping. One's nine, one's ten, Michael's 14, they've still got to stay by my side. They've still got the childhood, they still have enjoyments, but they just can't do things like walk down the street on their own just because of it's in Denise's mind, it's her anxiety that something could happen. So they can't do that. But Denise makes sure her family understand why she's so protective. I wanted them to grow up with what happened to James. You don't know the full extent of what happened to him. Even I don't know that. But I am as open as possible with them. James is the eldest brother, two other children. Um, well, he's my stepson as well. So, yeah, he, he is past the family. And 15 years after his death, the name James Bulger still has an impact around the world. Everyone in Liverpool remember James. Even if they didn't know him, they still say he's a part of their life now. People around the world, you know, they write to him and say he's a part of their lives. I'm sure as a community and people pull together, we can look out for other kids. And that's what I'm trying to do, is look out for other kids. This year, when James would have turned 18, Denise decided to create a memorial to him. The idea came from a meeting with broadcaster Esther Ranson. Every time I saw her interviewed about James' death, it seemed to me that it was unhealed, it was tremendously painful for her, she was really angry. And I thought to myself, no one has celebrated this little boy's life, so all she's got in her head is the memory of his murder, so no wonder she feels as she does. I thought it was time that James was celebrated properly. So I put the idea to her and she immediately took to it. She immediately said yes, because she wants the little boy she knew to be alive in other people's minds. Denise and Esther are visiting Cambridge, where the charity Red Balloon has set up a special school. Hello again. <laughs> Red Balloon is a safe haven for children who've been so badly bullied they can't go to mainstream school. And by the time we get them, they have often thought about or even attempted suicide. And our job is to start a recovery program. And the recovery program is sort of 70% academic work and 30% personal and social um, and therapy to help them really come to terms with what's happened to them. Next year, Denise wants to open a red balloon school in Liverpool and name it after James. Over the past 15 years, nothing's been achieved from his death. Um, no good's come from it, really. But there's going to be good in this. You know, we're going to be seeing kids become happier. This is Jake. Hello. Hi. That's William. Hi. Hello. That's Diana. Hello. And it's her birthday. Oh, happy birthday. It's my yeah. Tuesday. <laughs> if I can do that under James's name, it's going to be absolutely brilliant. Do you feel better now that you've got somewhere like this to come to? Yeah, I really like coming here. At least now I actually enjoy coming to school. Do you yeah. feel more relaxed and everything? Yeah, yeah I've like, been able to speak to people about what's happened. My education's obviously got better. I've got more confident. When we found this place, it was like a miracle. It's like saved my life. But looking around this, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And just seeing all the kids smile and the ways they're all getting on, like you've passed all kinds of exams and everything. You've just talked that you would have committed suicide if this house wasn't here. So I think it's a really good thing to do. And I'm desperate to get this house up and running now in Liverpool. I can't believe how much she's changed. I can't believe that the woman who could barely say a word, the silent woman, the shy woman I met, now does uh, interviews, uh, goes out and promotes the charity. She tells me she's got a reason now 
to walk out of her house, something to look forward to, and um, it's changed her completely. <laughs> you can see it in her face. She's enjoying it. She's enjoying finding things out, looking forward to things. It doesn't matter if there's a, a mountain, a wall in front of her, she will get through it, get past it to make this happen. She sets something in her eyes and she goes for it. You look really well. Thank you. I can't you. understand why kids are getting bullied today because you look absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Do you realise how much you've changed? I feel a lot different. I just feel, you know, I've got something to go for now and what I'm looking forward to is being able to pick myself up and say, I'm, today I'm going to visit the home and see how the kids are getting on in there and, you know, see what, what's happening in there. And that, that day I can't wait for. Happy birthday. I feel more positive, I feel a lot stronger. I've come a long way and I'm going to turn a new corner now and I just want to make sure that kids get the best of everything.